Good evening. Welcome to this evening's budget live stream event. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings to join us. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to give you a brief idea about how the evening's going to work. We're going to um, basically start with some introductions um, with our leader, council leader, Councillor Mary Ann Brocklesby, and then we'll be coming to the me other members of the cabinet before Councillor Rachel Garrick will give the presentation um, of the budget proposals for this year. After that, we'll be coming to the pre-submitted questions and then questions that you can post during the session using the Q&A function on this um, Teams meeting. Um, so in the first instance, um, I'd like to go over to Council Leader Mary Ann Brocklesby. Good evening, Mary Ann. Hello, everyone, and welcome. And so much thanks that you've taken time in a, I'm sure is a busy day at the end of the evening to come and talk to us and to, to listen to our budget proposals. We're all absolutely delighted because this is our opportunity to hear from you and to really get a sense of where you think um, we're going we've got the right ideas for the budget and where you think we need to think again or we could consider different options or you've got some suggestions of how we can make better savings to improve services for us all in Monmouthshire. Um, I'm councillor for Clonethley Hill, which is the northern part, uh, the northernmost part of Monmouthshire, right at the top of the Heads of the Valleys Road. Um, I'm going to pass you on now to councillor Rachel Garrett, who will be presenting the budget this evening and is at the opposite end of Monmouthshire in terms of wards to me. Thanks, Marianne. Hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Garrick. I, as Marianne says, I'm one of the county councillors in Caldercott. Um, my ward's Caldercott Castle. Um, I'm the cabinet member with the portfolio for resources. So my responsibility is the budget and I'll be taking you through the budget tonight. But um, I have other colleagues from the cabinet here today. So I'd like to hand you over to my colleague Angela, who's also one of our um, um, councillors from the south of the county. Thank you. I'm even further south than you, I believe, aren't I? Uh, yeah, I'm Angela Sandals and I'm County Councillor for Meagher East and Undy and Cabinet Member with responsibility for engagement. And that includes uh, looking after refugees, our libraries and hubs and democracy. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Councillor Martin Grocott now. Evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Martin Grocott, I'm one of the county councillors from Abergavenny uh, and my cabinet responsibility is education. Uh, I notice no questions have been submitted in advance, so please put your thinking caps on and get me some questions about schools. Shall we go to the presentation then? Yeah, it's a re hand over to Rachel now to get talk us through the presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Fabulous. So I'm here to talk to everybody tonight about the budget. And if we're going to talk about the budget, we need to talk about the context of that budget as well. So I keep using the word unprecedented. 2022 has been an unprecedented year for us. It's been really difficult. We've seen inflation, which is at a rate that we've not seen in the history of Monmouthshire County Council and the country hasn't seen since the 1970s. So we've got Brexit causing increases in material prices, in food prices. We've had a pandemic which has had an impact on the economy and also on the level of pressure on our um, council services in terms of things like care and homelessness. We've seen OPEC plus um, reducing oil production in early 2022, which drove up fuel prices and then also gas prices. And then we've seen your war in the Ukraine that's meant that gas prices have increased even further. On top of that, we've got a spiralling job market, which means that it's much more difficult for us to recruit and retain employees. So it's really, really challenging environment. And I think with that, do we we don't have the um, presentation up yet, do we? 
Oh, Rachel, if you can, if you can, I think we're going to need you to share your screen, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, OK, no worries. Let me just click a few buttons. And let's go to a presentation mode as well. So, what does that context actually mean for Mom Assurers a Council? Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I'm pressing buttons all over the place. What it actually means for us is we've got cost pressures of £26 million for our next financial year. That means to keep providing the services that we've provided this year into the next financial year, it's going to cost an additional £26 million on top of what we paid in 2022. So those cost pressures built up of about three or four things. Just the increase in the cost of services alone, that's £11.9 million. We all know that energy costs have absolutely skyrocketed and those energy costs for the council look like they're going to be about £4.5 million for 2023 to 2024. And then we've got pay awards. We need to pay our employees in a way that allows them to keep up with the cost of living and allows them to keep on working for us. So those pay awards are looking like they'll be about £7 million. Some of that will be hangover from the settlement from 2022, and some of them that will be from the new settlement in 2023. And then we as a council have at certain points borrow money. In order to service those costs, that's going to cost us an extra £3.2 million this year. So I wanted to show you all how we allocate our money and our expenditure within the council. So when we talk about the council, our budget entire in its entirety, what we think we need to spend for 22 to 23 is 185.7 million pounds. And a large, large part of that goes into two areas. That's children and young people and social care and health. Children and young people, that's mostly around the schools. So, Martin, this is all your fault. That costs us about £59 million for 2023. We then have social care and health coming in with 31% of our budget and £58.4 million. You'll see that there's quite a significant drop down then as we go to the rest of our services and commitments. And 13% of that is on our front facing services in community and places. We then have a whole host of other smaller allocations. So we've got the precepts and levies, council tax reduction scheme, borrowing costs, resources, that's our staff, mom life, that's our um, leisure centres and cultural pieces, democracy planning and people, and policy and scrutiny and customer service, and finally, our corporate management and insurance. And that all adds up to £185.7 million. Pounds. So I said we had £11.9 million pounds of service pressures. That's £11.9 million pounds increase in the cost of the services that we provide as a council. The largest part of that comes from children's social care, which is £4.4 .4 million. Pounds. That's a really volatile area that can go up and down very, very quickly and with a lot of pressure, particularly around high needs placements. And that's a really large part of our service pressures. And if you follow the council budget, you'll have noticed that our shortfall in 2022 has had a large part of its drive out of children's social care. We also have a big driver from adult social care, which is £1.8 million. That's with people needing increased care needs. We have an ageing population, so we have a big commitment on adult social care. And we have a lot more um, requirements with people coming out of COVID, who, people who are in the care system or going into the care system with an increased needs after um, experiencing the disease. We also need to pay our employees 
a real living wage. So that's a wage that allows our employees to work for us and be able to afford to live their lives. To keep up with what is the recommended real living wage, that will cost us an extra £1 million in the next year. During the pandemic, Welsh Government brought out new legislation to force policy changes across the country to ensure that people who become homeless are looked after appropriately and nobody is left out on the street. Councils haven't always been the best at doing that and we've calculated that it's going to cost us an extra £1.9 million to service that in the next financial year. A large part of that is going to be going into emergent immediate needs where people are being placed into temporary accommodation. We also see an increases of about £600,000 for children with additional learning needs. Those are um, additional children coming into the system and a wider range of um, needs being found within the county over a wider range of ages. Recycling and waste are looking at an increase of £200,000 and that's associated with things like haulage costs, so where it, fuel prices have gone up, it's costing a lot more for us to do that. There's also increases in treatment costs and the amount of income that we get from our waste streams does look like it's going to be lower this year. We spend a lot of money on passenger transport and fleet, and a lot of that is associated with home to school transport. Where we're seeing an increased need in that and things such as fleet costs are going up again through maintenance costs, maintenance costs and again through fuel. That's about £600,000 additional. We charge our residents for discretionary services that we provide for the council and we're anticipating that we have a shortfall in those incomes of around £800,000 this year. We also expect to need to increase our community safety to the tune of an additional £100,000. That said, we know what our pressures are, but we need to deliver a budget which is balanced and correct for our county. So when we look at this, cost of our delivering our services have increased roughly in line with inflation at 14%. So that's about 26.6 million pounds. We've also had income increases. So we get a government grant from Welsh Government. We also raise money through council tax and through discretionary charges for our residents. That's given us about 15.7 million or about 7.5%. Now as a council, we hold relatively low reserves. We hold third lowest reserves in the entirety of Wales. Some councils, I cite one to the Canantath, Cavilly County Council, hold much more substantial reserves and are able to dip into those to be able to bridge the gap in this year where it's definitely the rainy day in terms of council need. We're not in that position. What we are in a position to do is to earmark some of our reserves as contingency for when risks that are associated with a budget and all budgets have risks potentially realise throughout the financial year. So it's holding about three million pounds worth of reserves back for the instances where risks are realised in the budget and we're um, in need of paying out more than we anticipate. So we've got 26.6 million to get to um, find additionally 15.7 million pound, uh, pounds of that's been found through grants, council tax and charges, but we've still got a balance to be met. And that balance is 11.4 million pounds and that needs to be found, unfortunately, in service changes. And we're going to go through that now. So when I say service changes, we've spent a lot of time looking at our, uh, our um, potential savings. And we've prioritised putting people first and looking to maintain our quality and improve our services where we can. And remember, we're in this unprecedented year now. We're in this year where we've got a massive, massive gap in terms of our income and in terms of our service expenditure. When we look at the economy, we can see that inflation is starting to dip and it's our anticipation that the years after 2023 to 2024 are not going to be as hard as this year. So we're looking to build in future years on our services. 
When we've put this budget together, our senior lead team and our officers have, gone, have got together and spent innumerable hours putting it together. And on our side as councillors, the cabinet sat down for many, many, many hours as well. And we've gone line by line through this budget. We've gone line by line through every proposal that has been suggested as a saving. And we've made some very difficult decisions on the type of savings that are tolerable for our residents in this year. We don't want to impose all of these savings. And the only reason that we're making these choices is because we have a shortfall that means we need to make these changes. We've tried to make sure that these savings are the ones that are the most tolerable for our communities and our residents. So let's talk about what these savings are. So going back to that pie chart earlier, schools, children and young people, this is Martin's area. It comes in with a 5% net increase on our school budgets. That's a 2.8% efficiency saving left that's needed. So we think that it's going to take 7.8% increase to run schools next year. So we need our schools to find a 2.8% efficiency saving to close that gap. We're expecting schools to manage their budgets and in most cases, tap into their reserves where possible to get us through this incredibly difficult year. But we still have a gap. So we're looking for a further £300,000 worth of savings. And for, to the, in that, we're looking to our school support services. So we are the last council in Gwent that fully subsidise Gwent's music service. We're looking to align with other councils and reduce that subsidy at this point. That means that what we might see in reality is some reduced class based provision and parents will be asked by Gwent Music Service to increase the payments that they make for their children's individual instrument lessons. However, we really appreciate that music is really key to our culture in Wales. It's a big part of our heritage and we're keeping a small fund together to allow pupils from low income families to maintain their individual's music lessons. We provide breakfasts across schools for any child at primary level that needs or wants a breakfast in the mornings. As part of that, we also provide subsidised childcare and breakfast clubs. At the moment, that's a charge of one pound per session. Evening sessions can vary from about six to seven to eight pounds, but the childcare for the morning sessions are subsidised and it allows a wraparound childcare for many parents and carers to get to work. We're in a position where we feel we need to ask for an increase in those charges and we're looking to set that at a level of two pounds per session. We're also looking to reduce staffing levels in our school psychology service, mostly around positions that we've been unable to fit to fill recently. But we're going to be following a rigorous grant funding funding strategy in order to try and plug that gap. And we're also looking at using that funding strategy to plug gaps in support services for children with additional learning needs. So let's move on to uh, my um, cabinet's um, colleague Tudor's area. Yeah. That's social care. Uh, that's our social care budget. And again, that was the second massive part of that pie chart at 31%. We're increasing that by 7% in the next year. So we'll be increasing our adult social care budget by £1 million. What we're looking to do there is review our in-house provision and our um, outsourced provision and to look at making changes that make cost effective sense for our council. We're also looking at reviewing care packages to make sure that they're fit for purpose. And we're also looking at preventative schemes such as fall prevention. So we're focusing on, make, on preventing people getting into a position where they need to enter the care system in life. We hope we're expecting that that brings us savings of two million pounds. I mentioned earlier that one of our major pressures is children's services, and that was a 4.4 million increased pressure. So we're looking to increase children's services by 3.4 million. 
but we still have a further gap there. So we're looking to make savings of 1.4 million in our resources gap there. And again, we're looking at reviewing the way our decisions and the way we go about particularly high cost placements. And again, our outsourcing and our insourcing. So we're looking at giving a much more cost effective service, which we believe there's a lot of leeway to do in children's services. We still have some funding gaps to um, go through here. So we're also looking to remodel our learning disability and mental health teams and focus on local provision for young people with learning disabilities. A lot of that remodeling is going is along the lines of looking at the supervisory capacities of those teams and reducing capacity there. Our savings um, proposed there come to £300,000. OK, um, this is um, my cabinet colleague Sarah's area. She sent our apologies tonight. She would love to be here, but she's at a parents evening with one of her children. So. We believe that our leisure centres and our cultural services are a key part of our community. We can't understate the importance of leisure centres in the well-being, both mental and physical, for our residents and our communities. And we're committed to keeping those services open. We're increasing our budget for Mon Life by 22% as a result, but we still need to make £600,000 worth of savings. That will impact on some staffing levels and opening hours. When we talk about opening hours, we're looking at reviewing when people use our services, what are the quiet times, and making contractions around the quiet times in order to be able to keep those services open and keep them open at the times when people use them the most to drive some efficiency. You might be familiar with our Nature Isn't Neat program and our No May May approach. So we're looking to increase that and further reduce our mowing schedule across the county. That has the benefits of reducing costs for the council and it will increase biodiversity, which is incredibly important during our climate crisis. We're also looking to save over £1.3 million throughout the council. There's a drive to decarbonise the council by three quarters of a million pounds, looking at carbon saving efficiencies and also looking at the increases in our income from our um, solar farm estate as well. Further reductions there are a year's reduction in our spend on maintenance of our buildings and vehicles. We're going in terms of buildings to um, go to essential maintenance only, and we're looking at our vehicle maintenance schedules, which are much more above what the minimum requirements are and looking to bring them down to a sensible level. We're looking to reduce running costs on our energy consumption, which I talked about through decarbonisation and also on reducing our fleet and the mileage that our drivers use. We're also looking to rationalise our property estate to make sure that we use the buildings that we use appropriately and looking to see where we may not be using buildings to the same level that we should do and looking at what we should do with those buildings. So that's service redesign. We also should need to talk about the discretionary fees and charges that we charge. We're going to be asking our residents to pay a fairer price for the services that we provide. So that means where costs have increased or where services have been subsidised, we'll be looking to bring in additional um, charges on those. So that's got a um, income estimation of £1.4 million. Just like our leisure centres, we're committed to keeping our community hubs and libraries open. We believe they're a key part of our communities in terms of providing services that keep our communities running and many, many other services beyond just providing books, which are in themselves an incredibly important part of our community. So we're looking at proposing savings in our community hubs and libraries. And we're also looking at our contact centres, which we're going to keep open. But that's going to mean reducing some opening hours. Um, sorry, not some opening charges, hours, but reducing some of the employees that are in our contact centres. The impact for our residents 
is that it will take longer for telephone calls to be answered. You'll still be able to contact the council through our um, website, through MonLife, I'm um, sorry, MonLife, my MonLifeShare app, and you can always also contact your councillors as well. So let's talk about council tax. We've worked through what our outlay needs to be, what income we have from our um, government grants, what income we can generate through our discretionary services charges, and what savings we can make in our services. The gap left results in a need to increase our council tax charges by 5.95% this year. And that will bring us to a point where we can afford to continue to provide services. That 5.95% is significantly below inflation at the moment. So we're trying our best to keep our council tax as affordable as possible for our residents who are also facing a cost of living crisis. In terms of that, we're also um, offering help and support for lower income houses through our council tax reduction scheme as well. So there is support out there. What does that mean in terms of how much we're going to pay? If you're a regular average resident with a bandy household, a bandy house, that means that you'll be looking at an increase of £1.69 £1 per week or £7.32 per month based on a payment schedule of 12 months. So I mentioned about risks and our reserves earlier. All budgets carry risks. We do a lot of modelling in our midterm financial planning and we have a very good idea of what is happening to our economy, where our charges are going, but there's always risks that can realise throughout the year. Um, if we take, for example, the 2022 budget, we're a new administration. The budget was set in, a in March and April. We were elected to the council in May. So we have a budget that was previously set. That budget lasted four months and in and by that time it had over nine million pounds of risks realized. That means in four months we found that there was an additional nine million pounds of shortfall developed through the realization of risks where additional costs came up. So risks are a very, very real part of the council budget. Now, 2022 was an unprecedented year. Inflation was astronomical. Fuel costs were astronomical. We can see the economy starting to come back down now. We anticipate that we're not likely to see the level of risk realization in 2022 that um, we will see in 2023. So therefore, we've got three million pounds worth of reserves that we've earmarked to cover potential risks coming about and actually needing to be covered in 2023. We also have a capital programme budget, which you know oversees our maintenance and enhancement of our roles, roads, our schools, our leisure centres, our farms, and much, much more. They're a really important part of the services that we deliver or helping deliver services to our county. Because they're an important part of that, we're maintaining our capital services budget this year. So we'll be continuing to support our council, and um, priorities, and that goes along with our draft community and corporate plan. We've also got two main significant pieces of outlay in our capital programme for um, 2023 and 2024, and those are the commitment to build a new school in Abergavenny for ages 3 to 19. And also, and remember, I've talked a lot about social care as well here. We're building a new care home in Crick Road um, down in um, Monmouthshire this year. So that is an overview of this year's proposed budget. We're currently in the middle of consultation and Mary Ann, our leader, is very clear that we're doing this because we genuinely want to talk to our community 
about these proposals. It's an incredibly important year with some incredibly difficult challenges. And we really do believe that our residents', vo residents voices are important to this and that they, your views should be listened to. So this is our proposed budget. We're communicating with this and consulting on this throughout the county. We've been all across the county in the last few weeks and we'll continue to do that. And we'll be in Abergavenny next week. Um, we've got a budget page on the council website, which you can go to. And you can look at the budget proposals in much more depth if you'd like to. And while you're there, please take the time to fill in our online survey. In terms of due process, we have council scrutinies meetings, which we've been going through with our proposals, where we've been getting feedback and answering difficult questions from our councillors throughout the county, who also have an interest in making sure that this budget is the right budget. For we'll be looking to send our council tax, um, set our council tax and bring our final budget after consultation to a full county council meeting on the 2nd of March, which you are all welcome to attend and watch as some residents of the county. And at that point, you'll be happy to know that I'm going to stop talking and I think hand back to Jan in the first place to um, manage questions that we've had submitted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. Um, we've got a number of pre-submitted questions that um, I will read out before we get to the questions submitted live during the session. Um, the first one is from Denise. Um, she is asking um, about Mon Life and the leisure centres. Um, she says it's quite a long question, so I'm going to abbreviate it. So apologies for that, but hopefully I'll, I will get the crux of it. Um, She's very um, worried about the idea of cutting funding to the leisure centres. She believes that um, we should be investing more in leisure centres, not less. Restricting opening times is going to directly impact those who cannot use the leisure centre during normal working hours. And this is going to affect people who have health issues and me um, mental and physical well-being. Um, and she's also asking what plans do you actually have to upgrade and, and enhance the leisure centre, and specifically in Caldecott, and not impose limitations on an already outdated building and facilities? Um, and for answers to that, I'm going to go to Ian Sanders. He's our Chief, Chief Officer for Mon Life with responsibility for the leisure centres. Evening, um, Ian. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Denise. Um, as, you, as you've heard there, um, a, lot of, a lot of different difficult decisions being made and obviously one of the ones that most impacts um, Mon Life is the ability to, to keep continue with the service but thankfully I think this this budget does actually bring what is um, you know some some investment into the leisure services in particular this budget does give some uplift to help us with the huge energy costs that we've been seeing so you know there are some some positives in that and obviously it does recognize the value of leisure services and and also shows that MCC is prioritising as an important preventative and value service. So, you know, from from where I know you, your your question is around um, what it is the proposals we are putting forward. The officers are looking now and actively looking at data and looking to explore a reduction in opening hours, potentially around the, the long summer evenings and looking back from data um, from previous years, obviously before COVID and then after COVID and the recovery, you know, our summer, our summery, summer evenings in the swimming pool in particular are, are quiet. So the the sort of initial draft proposals is that we're we're taking an hour off each leisure each leisure site in the late summer evenings. Um, and obviously during the day in the summer, we've got huge things going on. It's really, you know, positive the leisure centres over the summer with exercise refer referral, fitness classes and lots of children's and sport play um, during the day. So we wouldn't be cutting any of that. And obviously to the very nature of the, the holidays means that the, the, um, the schools aren't swimming. So we can readjust the programme to potentially look and make sure that you have got some opportunities to swim in the evening. Obviously not when you'd prefer to swim, because I think you're hinting that you swim after nine, nine o'clock. But, um, you know, we'll do all we can. And, I would just encourage you to get in touch with the, the leisure centre manager and myself um, and we can we can really try and help and look at your specific needs but the data is telling us that that is the time when you know th there is less demand and 
you know, be remiss of us to not look at that in the in view line of the savings that the, the whole council is having to make. You're aware because um, you also asked about investment um, and you're aware we you know, we haven't we haven't sort of a, been successful with the with the um, funding for LUF. So we're looking at the future and looking at options and what can be done to ensure that investment does go into the site. And we're also looking at um, energy saving measures. So hopefully that's a, put some some of those questions and that gives you some answers to that. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, we've got one further comment on on that before you go in. Um, the um, the lady said, why is, is there a reason why they don't reduce the heating in the pools from a very hot 29 to 27 or 27? Is, is there a reason why temperature is maintained at a certain level? So Sorry. when you get below 28, it becomes very, it does become cold for some, some of the population. Obviously, our pools, you know, we're looking around 28, 28.5 normally. It, this is quite a complex question to answer and it does come into the investment into pool covers as well which we're looking at as a another part of the budget and some good news but if we if we maintain it much below 28 you start getting into difficulties with certainly our vulnerable populations and our younger children especially babies so we do try and maintain a reasonable level obviously the more advanced fitness swimmers could could deal with a colder temperature but um just to just to give you a bit of technical um, feedback on that we normally try and keep it around 28 28.5 Okay. Thank you, Ian. I think that there, there's a, a, a lot of questions coming in about that. But, um, I just want to re reassure the um, questioner that we have we've got quite a lot of other questions to get through, but all your comments and, que and questions relating to the leisure centre will be passed on to Ian and the team to answer. Um, as the other thing I would say is quite a lot of the questions. If we don't get all of them answered tonight, we will be uploading them onto the website, so you'll be able to have a look at the answers there as well. Um, next question um, is, I'm going to direct to our council leader, Marianne Brocklesby, if I may. Um, this is a question from Kyle, and he is asking, how will the budget change if the economy either improves or declines? Hello, Kyle, if you're online. Thanks for asking the question. Um, as, as Rachel said earlier, Council set budgets every year. Uh, there's nothing new about that. Um, this year is new and challenging for the, the level of shortfall that we have. But every year, a council sets a budget which they follow as best as they can. But you'll know if you've got a household budget, you can set it for a month, but it will move up and down depending on price changes or choices or heating and so forth. So th there will always be shifts in what the budget looks like as it starts to be implemented month by month. So the council last year before elections, they set a budget which they based on similar forecasts that we're making and what they expected to get from all from council tax, from Welsh government, from fees and charges, etc. But the situation, as you know, has changed over that time. So despite setting a budget that was at the point of setting it, just what we thought would cover all our costs, we weren't able to do that. So we were looking at for this year, a shortfall of nine million. So if you think about that, looking forward, I think we all we all want the um, the economy to improve. As individuals and a council, um, we're all very aware. Um, I'll point you to the news this morning where it, we're expecting to go into a recession this year. Um, in the latest forecast. So we're all very aware that we're unlikely, but you never know to have a um, a huge turnaround in the economy this year so we can sit back and relax and just see the money rolling in because the costs have gone down because our government at UK level or Welsh government can find more money for us. That's unlikely to happen but if it did then we would adjust accordingly and we would set it against our priorities that are directed by our community and corporate plan and those are priorities as uh, Rachel laid out in this budget they will remain the same there social care education um, affordable housing making sure that our leisure centers are freely open uh, for everyone M making sure that we're um, 
doing what we need to do for our roads, for keeping us safe, etc. So the short answer is we're always adjusting month by month and we're always looking in terms of what the economy is looking like, <clears throat> how we can make savings, but more importantly, how we can, within the cut of our budget, transform services and the way that we deliver it so we're more effective, we're more efficient, we're wise with our money and the quality remains the same, if not better. That's it, Carl. Thank you, Marianne. That's brilliant. Um, we are next moving on to a question which I believe um, Rachel Garrick, our Cabinet Member for Resources, um, is going to answer. And this has been submitted by Amanda. And it's um, she says, Monmouthshire has increased using private sector and agency staff during COVID lockdown and failed to review services which have not been reinstated, but staff continue to be paid and premises are empty. How is this justified as cost effective? So it's all about sort of social care. Um, sector so Rachel could you answer that one for us please yeah so um hopefully you'll have caught in the presentation that one of our targets for savings is actually to exactly review our in-house and our outsourced provisions in those areas as well um essentially um we increase using our private sector and agency staff during COVID that's quite right um but it can fluctuate and depend on the demands on the service because it, it's not a steady service. It goes up and down and it's also got a lot of um, impact from the employment market as well, which has been incredibly difficult in 2022. So you know, you've got people who are in the lower um, sort of scale of um, income looking to maximise their income as well, because actually they're experiencing the cost of living crisis as much as anybody else or possibly even harder um so you know and we import a lot of our um workers in that care sector from outside of the county itself and where it's costing people travel more to travel to work because of fuel prices people are looking to sort of reduce the amount of mileage they're doing and looking to see if they can work closer to home so yeah putting in a lot of effort to into effective recruiting and also into our retention practices as well and that is starting to have an impact in terms of being able to increase the number of in-house um, care provisions that we provide um we do constantly review our service and we are constantly looking to do that and there is a big program of work going on for the next year to ensure that we do review that and make a most cost effective delivery of that service that we can. That's fantastic. And um, I'm going to be coming back to you for I'm afraid um, is about tip booking. So our recycling centres. Um, Rebecca is asking, can we go back to turning up? Or is there a way of speeding up the booking process? Um, it apparently, at the moment, it takes up to two days between wanting to visit the recycling centre and actually getting an available slot. Um, will green bins be more expensive when fewer people are using this? Um, wider questions, basically, about the tip runs. Was that me you were coming back to? Sorry, yes, Jen. Yes, please. Yes. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> OK, so. You can book up to 24 hours in advance and I, I know I've booked the day before and got in for the next day um, but you might find you have to wait a few days to access sites as they're not you know they're not open every day of the week. We're currently running our sites at about 60% of their capacity at present but what we are looking to do is to automate the system fully so I think you would have all got the experience that we turn up at the um, refuse centre and you've got somebody with a piece of paper with a printout from the previous day on whose cars registrations are turning up. So we're looking to automate that system in re real time so that would make bookings possible for the same day so we can improve that service for um, customers and residents. Lovely, thank you. Um, our next question will be coming to you as well, if that's OK, Rachel. This is about the Seven Bridge and the High Beach Roundabout, um, also um, submitted by Rebecca. Um, the rules to close it at 40 mile per hour wind speed um, 
seems to mean much more traffic issues. Apparently the filtering that used to be in place is no longer there and there are instances of um, abuse between staff against staff manning the slip road and general questions about the height detection um, equipment. Is this a budget issue because it involves money to solve? So a lot of sympathy on that. Um, I've spent a lot of time in traffic like many people have around that area and I know a lot of the traffic towards the Severn Bridge itself, not the High Beach roundabout. We all know that that is a high volume roundabout that takes a lot of traffic, but it's been exacerbated a lot over the last six months um, due to the um, cable inspections that have closed the lane on each side of the Severn Bridge. So essentially, it's not really a budget issue for ourselves in Monmouthshire we don't own or manage those roads. They're owned by the Welsh Government. Um, the South Wales Trunk Road Agency is responsible for managing, maintaining, and improving that strategic road network in South Wales on behalf of Welsh Government. So if there is a budgetary issue, it sits with them. Um, that you can actually report an issue with that if you go to the con to the contact piece of Traffic Wales as well. But essentially, um, that's not one that would call on funds from our county council to solve. You are mute. I think you're mute, Jan. I had to be the one to do that. Sorry about that. I okay. can't get away with one of these presentations without having somebody on mute. I know, and it was me. Sorry. Um, we've got some great questions coming in from um, our viewers this evening. Um, the first one, I believe Martin Grocourt, um, our cabinet member for um, education, is going to answer for us. Um, it is what consideration or actions is the council taking to work with other local authorities to share resources, develop capacity across the local authority borders? Martin, could you add that one for us, please? Yes, certainly. Um, I think I'm picking this one up because quite often these collaborative services are around education or young people. Uh, and I think people would be surprised at how much collaboration there is already between the authorities in South East Wales. I'll give you a few examples. Certainly in my area in, in education, huge uh, collaboration on guaranteeing the quality of education in our schools through the education uh, assessment service covers the whole of South East Wales. More um, example of that might be CENCOM, the Special Educational Needs Communication Service, which provides uh, very specialist help for youngsters with specific communication difficulties that would be hard for one small authority to cover on its own. Uh, so um, looking to the wider council, there are lots of examples. The Greater Gwent Pension Fund that will look after us all in our dotage is, is one that most Stafford County Hall would be very interested in. Um, there are then things like the Shared Benefits and Revenue Service, which looks after um, making sure that people get their full entitlements when they're claiming things like universal benefit. Um, there is the Strategic Procurement Service, which enables us alongside Torvine and Cardiff to purchase in greater bulk. So there, there are large areas where collaboration is already firmly in place. I think in the six years I've been a councillor, I've seen the movement towards that increasing uh, because it provides that uh, greater efficiency in size, I think. Um, so lots of examples there. At the same time, of course, Monmouthshire is very anxious to get the, the best possible cost efficient services, but where it, it's sensible to collaborate with neighbouring authorities and there is shared expertise that we can use, then certainly we do so. Thank you, Martin. Um, that's great. Um, we've got um, two other questions. So we've got um, what does a fairer price for services actually mean? I think probably Rachel is, is best positioned to answer this. 
And a secondary level to that question, um, can you provide detail of the kind of services that residents will see an increase in charges, please? OK, so we talk about a fair price. What we mean is paying a price approaching the cost that it is that it costs to provide the service and essentially acknowledging that prices have increased to provide the service and therefore some of those prices we do need to pass on through the fees themselves. So you will see an increase in prices. Um, so in terms of those fees, it, it's a vast array. I often use car parking charges. Garden waste is a particular hot topic at the moment, but we're also talking about school meals, building control fee, fees, um, fees that you when you put in planning permission, um, cemetery charges, registrar income. It's a really, really broad spectrum of discretionary services and other fees that on um, services that we provide. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. Um, the next question, um, I think we're going to Councillor Grocut for this one. Um, how much money is spent on out of county placements for children and have these costs been scrutinised carefully? I'll make a start on this and then I'll call in Jane Rogers, who's one of our senior officers. Um, I can reassure uh, whoever asked this question that it is incredibly difficult to put a, a, a child or a young person into an out of county placement. Uh, and, and in this day and age, every effort goes into retaining a child in their local community with their family and friends and so on. Where, wherever possible. But, but the reason I'd like to start on, on this answer is that, in fact, I spent many years uh, as an inspector for Ofsted looking at some of these very, very specialist schools. And just to give you a little flavour of why we would not be able to accommodate some of these children in our own local schools. One example was at, at, at the um, Royal School for the Blind in Exeter, where I saw two, two members of staff teach a child who was deaf and blind how to swim. Now, that was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my whole life. I can also remember vividly going into a school where a child was using an, a, an electronic system attached to a computer because the only way she could communicate was by blinking. She had no speech and virtually no movement. And yet she was able to learn and I was able to assess the quality of learning as if she was in any normal school in her mainstream locality. So what I would say before I hand on to Jane is that I think as a local authority, we have got out of common humanity to provide the best education that we can. In education terms, that means that we will spend in any one year about three million pounds on helping youngsters to learn when if they were just left to the provision we could make, we would not be able to begin to meet those needs. Uh, Jane, would you like to come in and, and, and uh, give your professional expertise here? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Grocott. Um, uh, from a children's services point of view, uh, we do have a number of children who are placed in out of county um, placements. They are on average more expensive than our in-house placements, but as um, Councillor Grocott has explained, sometimes these are uh, children with uh, complex needs um, who, who require sometimes quite specialist placements. In terms of the, the level of oversight we have of, of those placements, it's um, fairly robust. Uh, the social worker, when they are setting up that placement, looks carefully at uh, the child's needs and does their best to really match the child's needs to, to the placement that we're procuring. 
There's a transparent cost template that we use when we are um, commissioning that service. Once the child's in placement, the, the social worker has regular contact with that child, seeing them on a on a regular basis, uh, seeing them alone and outside of the placement so that there's, a, there's any concerns that the child would feel reluctant to share, you know, at their home, that they have that that extra that that opportunity to do so with their social worker. Um, we also have separate from that a contract monitoring so that the uh, the sort of value for money aspect of the placement is is looked into on, on, a, on a routine basis as well. And over and above that, um, any any services that um, are procured for children are subject to um, Care and Wales Inspectorate um, oversight uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, we've got one more question, um, which I'm going to go back to Rachel for, if I may. Um, what has happened to the retail properties that Monmouthshire County Council previously uh, purchased? Are they making a profit or a loss? What's the situation with that, please? OK, so that refers to the retail park in Newport that was purchased um, in the last term of um, the previous council. Um, it's um, if you frequent um, Newports at all, um, it's the part which holds Cineworld, the McDonald's, the Harvester, etc. Um, in terms of that, it's been turning a small profit. It's not as high as anticipated or hoped for, but it has been turning a small profit. Um, we're very aware that the economy is going into a recession. Um, we're very aware that Cineworld is, um, has been in administration in the United States and is looking at reviewing its um, sort of um, asset list within the UK. We're also aware that one of the other major um, providers, Inflate, recently closed its doors. So we're keeping a watching brief on that, but it has today given us a small profit. Thank you, Rachel. Um, that is all the questions we all, uh, we might have some more coming in. I think that's pretty much all the questions we have at the time. Um, Mary Ann, did you want to um, have a few words to round the session up? Yes, thank you so much, everyone. These were really, really interesting and useful questions. Um, I'm going to take them away, reflect on what you've asked them, relook at the budget when we present it on March the 2nd and discuss it with the council. Um, because what we want to do is to make sure that we are listening to you, but not just listening, that we are responding to the comments as they come through. And I would ask you, if you haven't already done so, to go online and uh, fill in the survey um, that we've got up there. We'll try and put a link somewhere, won't we, Jan? Um, because it's already we want... in the chat. Yeah, fantastic. Because we, what we want um, to hear from you on the survey is what you think we've got right, what you think we can got should do differently and also any suggestions you've got for where we can be more efficient that we can use other, the money wisely um, but improve the quality of the services that we reach out for you we'd really like to hear from you and thank you so much i really appreciate you all coming tonight <laughs>